You thought it was safe to go to sleep, but nope, we're in your dreams too, bitch. It's us, the pod people, your worst nightmare. I'm Matisse Van Rossum, and I'm joined as always by Ben Sheets. Hey, bitch, coming for you. And Eugene Lundeen. Man, you ready to listen to some podcast, bitch? I don't know about you guys, but I'm excited to talk about the nightmares that I've been having. You've been having nightmares too? What? What have they been? Uh, have they been clowns or people with knife fingers? Uh, Harvey Weinstein, actually, oh, with shit. knife fingers. Oh, with the knife fingers? <laughs> oh no! Has he said anything in these dreams? Giving yeah. you clues? To yeah, he him? says. He says, "Hey, if you let me tickle your taint with these knife fingers, then I'll give you a part in my new movie." One, two, no. Harvey's coming <laughs> on you. How did you know how my nightmare ended? <laughs> I've had the same nightmares. I haven't gotten to sleep in three days. I, I've been avoiding seeing him. How have again. you been doing it? I, I find speed. lots of speed. <laughs> yeah, lots of speed. I find these nightmares kind of titillating. I um Oh you do you do you like them? I like I've them been sleeping bit? more than usual lately. <laughs> <laughs> just trying to chase the chase the Weinstein. Just no come back. He's wearing the same sweater that Freddy Krueger does, but it's also the same size that Freddy Krueger's sweater is, so it's uh, very sounds, small on that sounds, Yeah, incredibly tight. <laughs> it's like a crop top. It basically is a crop top except imagine a crop top that like only covers like half of his nipples <laughs> <laughs> see i've been having nightmares similar to those but it's been dan schneider and he's had the knives on his feet so he's been, <laughs> he's been chasing me around like that it's usually pretty scary but it always ends in foot rubs so i How, just wake up feeling weird wait like him rubbing your feet or are you rubbing his knife feet it's like a 69 of foot rubs <laughs> where i have to rub his feet while he rubs mine and it's scary because he's on top so I can't let the knives. I'll make like, you my gibby baby. <laughs> <laughs> That's called a uh, a seventeen. But one nice thing about the dreams, though, is that I do have a show on Nickelodeon now, and so I actually have also been sleeping a lot more. Yeah. So that's, that's interesting you say that. Maybe. Yeah, uh, look for me in the next big Weinstein production, <laughs> uh, Amityville The Awakening 2, even more awake. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to play... Like, the opposite of Raisin Boy, you're going to be a grape, super swelled up. How did you know? Oh, man, that was in my dream. <laughs> Amityville, The Awakening 2, eyes wide open. <laughs> eyes wide awake. <laughs> man, these have been some pretty scary dreams. I, I guess it might have to do with the state of the world, the movies we've watched, and some of the news that we have today. Yeah. Speaking of, have- yeah, it looks like we've got... Uh, a few uh, brief news stories to get into today. Ben, why don't yeah, you... Yeah, it's only been a week, so there's not a ton of big news, but we have a few stories. Uh, first, uh, the Cloverfield movie that we've been covering pretty extensively lately. Uh, as much as we can. There's might a have a new title. Um, apparently, they started one of those ARGs that they, they do with all the big Cloverfield movies, and uh, people have found that the title for the new one may be uh, Cloverfield Station. Which I think is a worse title than God Particle. Yeah, I'd have to agree. Yeah. I think at this point, we've already got Cloverfield, we've got 10 Cloverfield Lane. Do they have to put the word Cloverfield into the movie so we know? Like, they probably feel like they have to. The The lame part is, like, station isn't a descriptive enough word for, like, a space station with astronauts. It could as easily be It sounds like a train trains. station. Yeah. That's what I was thinking, too. If I didn't know that this took place in space and I heard the title Cloverfield Station, I would definitely think it was about trains right. or, or buses. Times have been tough for the Cloverfield monster. Now he's a bus driver. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he has to take the bus to get where he's going. Yeah, blew through all that Cloverfield money, and now <laughs> he just has to work in public transportation. But I, they could have just called this the Cloverfield Particle or something, because the the title before was the God Particle, right? Yeah, which is right. a cool that. title. Or they could have called it the God Cloverfield. I don't know, <laughs> the Cloverfield Particle. Yeah. <laughs> But Cloverfield Station, yeah, it just sounds sounds a little goofy. Yeah, and I'm seeing from this article that the only reason people think that it's might be Cloverfield Station 
is because on Reddit, somebody found a uh, the LinkedIn page of someone who worked as a lighting artist on a uh, movie called Cloverfield Station that otherwise wow. has Man, not been... Calling yourself a lighting artist is a oh. little excessive. <laughs> yeah, what's the difference between a, a lighting artist and like a gaffer? the the fancy title that's true bragging on linkedin is the only difference yeah i guess uh that's that's the cloverfield news yeah and other than other than that we coming on 420 still don't know shit about it i don't have the time anymore to like piece together clues about a movie that is just going to be in theaters regardless yeah i mean i was all about those arg stuff like a decade ago yeah when same I was in middle school but yeah exactly when you have nothing but time yeah but now i have so many other things i could be doing like recording this podcast or dreaming about harvey weinstein all of the the people who really like trains are probably really excited about this yes I know. I fuck know. yes a movie for us train lovers they'll be <laughs> sorely disappointed <laughs> In other news, uh, we may be getting a Devil's Rejects sequel. Um, I know you guys haven't seen Devil's Rejects, but honestly, it might be Rob Zombie's best movie. Um, That's always what I've heard. It's very good. the The original Devil's Rejects came out in o three o five. It was technically a sequel to House of a Thousand Corpses, so it's it's interesting seeing them. Make another sequel 13 years after? That seems like that's been the trend lately, though, is trying to revive uh, old franchises like many, many years after the fact. I don't think it's been wildly successful yet. Maybe with maybe Blade Runner, the new Blade Runner is the most successful example of that I've seen, which I thought was a legitimately very good movie. It's so tough to take these old movies that people love and then try to follow them up like 15 fucking years later because at that point who really cares what's the last movie rob zombie even directed i feel like he does he even make music anymore too i i have no idea what he's the been last thing i heard decade. from rob zombie is he was getting really mad because some kids had a skateboard park near his house and it was too loud late at night oh my god wow what yeah fuck and off rob zombie so he he like demanded that they move the park away from his house oh that they just pick up the entire skate park and move it away from rob zombie's house yeah yeah the he was getting very up in arms which about is it. almost certainly a haunted house all year long yeah definitely and that's not obnoxious to the neighborhood but the skate park is yeah um, i i think the last movie he did was the lords of salem right and it's been like five years since then if he's done anything since then i haven't heard of it no me least. either i don't know what to expect from the devil's rejects 2 which has a very bad subtitle as well it's the devil's rejects 2 three from hell how do you follow up two with three that sounds confusing the devil's (laughs) rejects two three from hell i mean i guess you could say it's technically the third movie in the series yeah maybe this movie will be good i i don't know and certainly my experience with rob zombie films has just been the halloween remake i watched house of a thousand corpses long time ago when i was super young so i can't really say much about the quality of that uh, didn't leave a huge impression on me. And I saw his animated movie, El Super Bisto, oh. which it's just, it's dumb, goofy, raunchy, adult cartoon. Doesn't have much else going for it. Yeah. So if you like jerking off to cartoons, well, I guess go go check it out. They There's like a whole musical. Sign me up. There's a musical sequence in it about jerking off to cartoons. So oh I, I think. God. How meta. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, how meta. (laughs) It looks like he actually released a movie in 2016 called uh, 31. Never heard of it. It obviously didn't make much of a mark. Never heard of uh, it. What's the... I hadn't heard of it. What's it about? Apparently, uh, the letterbox description is, Five carnival workers are kidnapped and held hostage in an abandoned hell-like compound where they are forced to participate in a violent game, the goal of which is to survive 12 hours against a gang of sadistic clowns. That sounds... Very much like a Rob. Zombie yeah, movie. <laughs> sounds like a mix of like Saw and The Purge. 
I feel like if you had like if you had just read me that synopsis cold and asked me to guess who made that movie, I think Rob Zombie would have been my first guess. I'd yeah, say that yeah. or Kevin Smith. So, because <laughs> <laughs> his his bar has been set sort of low now with the movies he makes, but. Oh God, we could do a whole Kevin Smith horror movie episode. <laughs> I'd yeah. rather not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, the next piece of news. Yeah, final piece have. of news. Uh, the movie Lords of Chaos uh, just got its first poster out. Uh, Lords of Chaos is uh, a movie about the Norwegian black metal scene. You know, Burzum and Mayhem and Euronymous and all that crazy stuff. Lots of murder and church burning. Really, really interesting story overall. I don't know a whole lot about this movie, but I'm very familiar with the story, that the true story that it is telling about uh, Euronymous being murdered by Vark Vikernes of Burzum. It's, it's an insane story. It's yeah. crazy. Not many people may know it. You, when people think of black metal bands and church burning, a lot of that might seem edgy and just used for shock value, but these were people that truly committed oh, to this sort of lifestyle and image. Yeah, it's, I, I didn't even know a movie was being... I'm surprised one hasn't been made sooner. Well, there's a, there's a documentary called Until the Light Takes Us that is really fucking good. That's about the whole thing, and they actually interview uh, a lot of the people who were around at that time. They... They interview probably more than anybody else, Varg Vikernes himself, before he was released from prison. And uh, that's a great, great movie. It's on YouTube, the whole thing. It's free. Definitely worth watching. But this this poster looks pretty fucking awesome. And I'm uh, I'm quite excited for this movie. Yeah, I'm really excited. The, the funniest thing about this to me is uh, I remember seeing something about Varg Vikernes being super pissed off because he's being played by a Jewish guy oh, in the movie, oh <laughs> which I, I I think is great casting. That is very good. That's funny, man. I like Burzum's music, but that that dude is just an insane old racist. Yeah, he, he is a literal Nazi. He is he is uh he is like the definition of your racist uncle at Thanksgiving who you have to like put up with while he's just spewing utter nonsense and you just kind of have to like politely nod and not like start a fight with him in front of the rest of your family yeah. that's basically how i feel about that dude he's very active on youtube lately oh man Makes and a those... lot of very racist uh powerpoint presentations oh. <laughs> Uh, They're so cringy, dude. Yeah. They're so cringy. He, he makes a lot of very racist PowerPoints and then a lot of LARPing videos. <laughs> yeah, because those what? are his two big passions, white supremacy and LARPing. Yeah. Well, when you think of LARPing, I mean, that's his, that's a super white thing to do. I that guess, is a very so. white yeah. thing to do. <laughs> that's where he feels truly at home. Just He can escape himself and become a mage or whatever. Some shit. <laughs> Not an insane murderer. If people have heard of this story, they might know about uh, an album cover that was made from one of their albums, a uh, for the band Mayhem. I should I should specify, yeah. and one of the lead singers took his life, and a, a band member found his body. It was it was Euronymous, the guy who got murdered. Right, yeah. okay, right, yes. Um, and he took pictures of the body, and it ended up being uh, used as like a bootleg album. Yeah. And so just this insane twisted take on mortality and also their hatred for the church and whatnot. Like they did actually burn churches. Burned out a sense. bunch of churches. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, These guys lived it. It'll be super interesting seeing how the movie comes out because Jonas Ackerland is a pretty interesting director. He did mostly music videos before this, but he also did the movie Spun. I don't know if you've ever no. seen it. Mm-mm. Um, pretty good movie. I'm always very wary of music video directors. Certainly, I mean, hey, there are a lot like yeah. uh, Michelle Gondry, and there, there's a whole slew of directors that started doing music videos, but a lot of the like, you guys ever see the Lincoln Lawyer? 
Man, no, it's not no, a I bad don't. movie, but it's one of those you watch it and it's it has such a sleekness to it. It's like, yeah, this is by a guy who well, does music videos. With a movie, yeah. with a movie like this where it's about black metal and the black metal scene, I think uh, a music video director is not actually a bad. Yeah. Fit well, for the that. the interesting thing is Ackerland is from Sweden, and at the time he was a big part of the. Uh, Norwegian black metal scene. Oh, really? So it, Did he do a, like a lot of their music videos and stuff at that maybe. time? Maybe. I don't think. Okay. I don't know I if don't. he did or not, but I know he was well, somewhat involved. Cool. I'm I'm curious to see what this movie is going to be like because it is one of those uh, based on a true story thing, so I'm sure it'll be pretty heavily dramatized uh, in order to to make it like a, a narrative film and probably also if it's supposed to be like a, a horror style movie that there's probably going to be plenty of uh, heightened uh, senses of reality, yeah. I will say. Yeah. But what I like about the poster is at the very bottom under all the credits, it says based on truth and lies, hmm. which I think is uh an interesting way to put it. And I like that better than based on a true story or inspired by true events yeah. because it acknowledges that there is definitely an element of, uh, of fiction that's being explored. Just like any fucking movie that's based on a true story. Yeah. You can base whatever you want on a true story, you know? I don't know. Well, that's the thing. You know, even with documentaries, you don't just want the accountant's truth right. of something. You don't want just a retelling of what exactly happened. Right. You want to get at the core of what's going on. So it, it'll be interesting to see. Rory Culkin is starring in it, which is interesting. Sky Ferreira is in it. I just saw uh, Seager Rose is doing the m music. Really? Yep. Whoa. So that's interesting. extremely interesting. That's very, that sounds very cool. It's supposed to premiere next week, which will probably Oh, wow. Be, I, yeah. can't, I, can't imagine, I can't imagine Seager Rose doing like, uh, like black metal. Yeah. I wonder if, that's, if they're delving into that. Yeah. Well, it, that's going to be interesting. It's, yeah. I'm excited for this movie. Me too. I, yes. I, I, I hope I, it's... I just found out about it right now, but that is very cool. It is happening. I, I hope it's going to be good. I think that pretty well wraps up our news yeah. segment for the week, don't you think, guys? Nothing yeah, else happened. Yeah. All right. Well, then in that case, let's uh, dive right in. This is another uh, original versus remake episode. Uh, we'll be talking about Nightmare on Elm Street. OG and remake, and closing things out with a discussion of Wes Craven's new nightmare. Well, I feel like for a lot of people out there, the Freddy Krueger character, much like Jason Voorhees or Michael Myers, is a staple in our culture. Yes, but For absolutely. those who don't know, the movies revolve mainly around a group of teenagers, an entity called Freddy Krueger, who has blades on all of his fingers, haunts these teenagers dreams and kills them off one by one in increasingly creative ways as the series goes on if but, he kills you in the dream you die in real life yes yes basic but premise the first movie certainly before all of the sequels spinoffs the the dumbing down of what the concepts originally were this film is mainly about the blurring of dreams and reality for these teenagers as they are being tormented by this spirit. This was directed by Wes Craven. Yeah. Um, Probably this comes what after like his movies Last House on the Left and things of that nature. So, and also, uh, we should mention this came out in 1984 where a horror movie landscape had been thoroughly established already. Right, this is already post-Halloween, uh, post-Texas Chainsaw, post- uh, Post-Friday the 13th post, as post well. Post-Friday the 13th. Uh, yeah, so this is pretty thoroughly entrenched in the the horror renaissance of the, of the late 70s, early 80s. Yeah. And this is definitely what Wes Craven is uh, most well-known for. I haven't seen all of his stuff, Um I really love Last House on the Left. Uh, I think that's a really, really great film. That was his first film, actually, his oh, first wow. feature. Yeah, it's uh, it's an experience. He has a lot of great movies that kind of go under the radar too. I think the hill, the original uh, Hills Have Eyes. Hills oh, Have yes. Eyes, Craven. Oh, that's right. Uh, People Under the Stairs is an incredible movie. 
um, kind of topical with that chained up kids oh, story God, in the oh, news. Oh, no. <laughs> um, but, well, let's put it in context a little bit. Night, this Nightmare on Elm Street movie, it came out in 1984, uh, right around the same time as, you know, Halloween 3, Friday Jason the 13th, four, go is, 5. Yeah, Jason Goes to Hell. Um, yeah. Or, Whatever. So at this point in slasher movies, the the premise was almost getting a little stale at that point. You know, it was just a masked figure coming by and stabbing people. Right. You know, it was losing the creative charm. So uh, getting Nightmare on Elm Street was a really interesting breath of fresh air, in my opinion. Yeah, I the think... the slasher genre. I think Wes Craven really... Uh, found a extremely creative way to sort of subvert some of the the horror tropes of the time especially when you're dealing with dream logic like anything can happen yeah you know so it's a it's a really fresh take on on slasher films you know freddy krueger is very much in a lot of ways a sort of generic slasher villain he's much quippier talks a lot more has got a lot of good one-liners but just the idea that he exists in this world of dreams and that he has control over that and all he has to do to kill you is is capture you and kill you in your nightmare it's uh it's a really good idea yeah right because previously every other slasher villain has just been a gross-looking person <laughs> wanting to to mur- murder for vengeance silently. The, uh, silent characters too a lot. Yes, yeah. the most they do is teleport around through clever editing. <laughs> and Freddy Krueger was one of the first ones who could actually teleport. So he had unlimited potential compared to every other horror movie villain that exactly. had been established. So it's it's no wonder that this series tries to expand on all that as they go on. This one, uh, the Freddy Krueger character is pretty subdued g- compared to everything we see in other films. Certainly he's still he's still pretty goofy in a lot of moments. There's a, a scene early on in the beginning where he uh, he's haunting one of the girls and he cuts off one of his fingers. He's like, watch this. And he cuts <laughs> it off and blood splurts out. It's very goofy things. He like cuts open his chest and there's like maggots and like green oh, slime yes. coming out of it. Well, like when she first sees him in the alleyway and his arms like stretch out super long to, yes, and yeah. to touch the either wall of the alleyway is just like this uh, like rubber scare crow man but even those moments i think play more into the horrors of just dream reality because a lot of those are things that are very visceral well the thing about it is i i give a pass to a lot of the silliness of the dream sequences because while they are kind of silly in reality following a dream following the logic of a dream you know, in that context, it works. Absolutely. Yeah, because, like, when you're having a dream, you never question the weird things that happen. It's just when you're existing in that in that dream logic state, it, it just is, you know? I, I agree with you. Like, you can pass off a lot of the sort of sillier, weirder aspects as just being like, yeah, well, this is a dream. But just because it's a dream doesn't mean it can't hurt you yeah right. that's what's so scary about freddy krueger yeah well and the thing that works as well is you know they don't play too much into it being a dream always they right. they accentuate reality without making it obvious that it's a dream every time well because as soon as people start realizing that freddy can get them in their dreams they start depriving themselves of sleep trying to force themselves to stay awake and i don't know if you guys have ever been a very long time without sleep but at a certain point like dream logic definitely starts seeping into your waking life eventually you just sort of start dreaming with your eyes open and that's something that's really cool about nightmare on elm street is that it really does blur that line between what's real and what's in the dream because at a certain point they become one yeah exactly i was uh, doing a little bit of research for this episode before we started and i found this really interesting tidbit apparently uh wes craven came up with the the idea for this story based on a series of la times articles 
uh, back in the 80s about uh, a group of South Asian uh, Hmong refugees that escaped Pol Pot, came to the U.S. Uh, three men had all died in similar situations where they were young and otherwise healthy, uh, but they would have a nightmare and then refuse to sleep for as long as they could. And then finally they would fall asleep, wake up screaming and die. And the autopsies uh, couldn't find any heart failure or anything. They just linked it to dying of unknown causes. They actually like gave it its own name called uh, Asian Death Syndrome. Almost implying like it only can happen to Asian men. <laughs> like, watch out, Asian men, you have weak hearts, you're gonna have nightmares. And, you, well, bet, you better look out, Eugene. I do have to. Well, apparently, I've heard that a lot of Asian people have sleep paralysis, that they suffer from it. F- more than other races, I guess. Maybe that's racist to say, but that's that's uh, something that I've heard before. So certainly if they're among refugees, I can imagine they're dealing with a lot of emotional baggage. So Oh, sure. That's that's an incredible thing that he got that inspiration. Yeah. To, uh... I think the, f- the fact that he used like this story as a basis for the idea of the film lends it in effectiveness that if he had just made it all up wouldn't more credibility yeah. in a way yeah. because it's it's a thing that i guess well i guess now that has occurred and makes you think about the power of your own mentality and what you're own what you're going through because yeah. i hear a lot of people which this is actually something i did not get a lot from the film. I think this is a very effective horror movie. There are scenes that are genuinely unsettling, but it seems a lot of the concepts, they talk about teenage adolescence and that sexual awakening, promis- uh, that promiscuous behavior, and how, just like in the Halloween films, how these 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 people get slaughtered down almost as a, as a metaphor for that sort of struggle as, as being punishment teenager. for their uh, yeah, yeah for their for their actions. So I didn't feel that very much in this film, and it's that thing where John Carpenter even talks about how he didn't want to imply that in his film. It was just a bunch of dumb teenagers having sex. They weren't paying attention to the world around them. But I wonder if it's different for this movie. If there was a attempt to try and make that connection, and if you guys felt that way, or maybe it's just critics fawning over it. I, I was not really sold on a lot of the horror moments, except for the kills, and I think that's when it really shines. Like, they, they put you in this world, they make you feel that it's not just created for the horror movie villain to live in, that it is the world of these teens, and their lives are being invaded by this yes, force. Yes, very much. And I think much. little details like that are so important to making a film better than, say, something like Friday the 13th, which is still, it's an iconic character, but the first film doesn't have a whole lot else going for it besides just being a slasher film. Normally the formula with slasher films and even just horror films in general is there's always like a setup kill where somebody dies basically in the first scene usually and that's how we know, okay, there's a killer, and then then we're introduced to our main characters. That's sort of the way it goes. But in this one, we do open with uh, this girl being, like, stalked through uh, this, like, industrial, like, factory setting, this old dilapidated factory, by this, like, strange man with knives for fingers. But then she wakes up. And it's like, oh, I just had a really bad dream. And then we see her going on about her life. She goes to school and then and she tells them about her nightmare and she has them over that night because her parents are out of town or something and she doesn't want to sleep alone because she's really been affected by this like really terrible nightmare. And then after all of that build up, then she does have another nightmare, which does ultimately end with her being killed. And that's our first indication as the audience that there is overlap between dream and reality. I mean, obviously, Freddy Krueger and these movies are such a staple at this point that like everybody knows the premise. Everybody gets it. But from watching this from the perspective of somebody in 1984 when this was fresh, like that's uh, 
I, I think that first kill, it was probably like a, a really spectacular moment for audiences, not only in just like how over the top and well executed it is, but also in that like, oh shit, this guy can kill people in their dreams right. and, and then some, they die in real life. Some audience, uh, some viewers might find it goofy now just because you, you think like, oh, she's just on a bunch of strings, like being held well, up. Well, no, she's, him, but... she's not. It's, it, they obviously built a rotating room so because she's being like dragged across the ceiling and they just have the camera uh, fixed on a certain point on the floor so that it looks like she's being dragged across the ceiling, but it's all practical and it's not just on strings well, and it looks there's, really there's good. There's moments where she's not like against the wall where she is actually like spinning around. Yeah, so. a, a little bit. But so I think those moments, those those might seem goofy to people, but I I, I thought it was just. I actually that's, find that's a scary thing. I actually find that scene extremely effective. Yes. Much much more so than when they copy it in the remake, which yes, I don't want. Yeah. We'll, 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 we'll get we'll into that. that. We'll get into that. Yeah. Definitely. I don't I don't want to jump ahead of ourselves, but I think uh, a lot of the effects still hold up really well in this movie. Um, which is always just that, like, practical over CGI, it works. Like, when Nancy, the main character, Heather Langenkamp, is uh, lying in her bed sleeping, and the wall behind her, like, you see Freddy, like, pressing through the wall and stretching it like a oh, piece yes. of fabric, and he's sort of just, like, looming over her bed, like, that still looks really good. Once again, much better than when they did that in the sequel. Oh, yeah. I think I think a lot of it holds up really well. The scene where Johnny Depp gets sucked into the bed and sp it sprays a shitload of fucking blood everywhere. Yes, yes. Yeah. Which some people might not know, or maybe that's the only thing they know about this movie, but that Johnny Depp was, uh, he's the boyfriend of Nancy. Yeah, this is, is like his, his, first his debut, yeah. his debut film role. It's uh even has an introducing Johnny Depp credit. Yes. So cuz even though he doesn't have many scenes in it, he does stay around for a good while because mm -hmm. he's there to help out Nancy. And I like it too. He seems like a pretty useless boyfriend. Oh, very much. The whole yeah. movie when Nancy uh, starts having more of these dreams, realizes what's going on after her friend's uh, murdered. Uh, she wants to try and go back into the dream. This is something that happens in a lot of the films as well. After these murders have occurred, they eventually fight back against Freddy Krueger. Yeah, she she wants to do uh, some dream investigation. Yes, yeah. <laughs> dream and investigation. She goes in one time and... Johnny Depp is supposed to wake her up if she starts to struggle, but he, he passes he just out. falls asleep immediately. She wakes up, thankfully, because she knocks over her alarm clock, and so it starts ringing, and he chews her out. He calls her, he calls him, like, a useless son of a bitch or something, and I, I thought that was... Yeah, and he's just like, what did I do? He's like, you're... Yeah. I, yeah. All I... Literally, all I asked you to do was stay awake. It's that fucking simple, and you <laughs> can't even do that. Yeah, he's extremely ineffectual. But yeah. like it's fine. I I don't I don't need him to do anything. No, and it, it plays because he's not taking it seriously. He's like, it, okay, yeah, fight this dream creature. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll stay up for you, sure. So and, and man, Heather Langenkamp is great in this. I think she's a. We were talking about this last night, but I think she's a very underrated actress. Yeah, she hasn't been in a whole lot outside of the the couple of uh, nightmare sequels that yeah, she did. She was in the third one and New Nightmare. Yep. Yeah. Well, she but. she's done a lot of TV as well. Yeah. Eight, saw, so. Eighteen Wheels of Justice. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever the fuck that is. <laughs> and she was on shows back in the 80s and 90s as well. So yeah. she, she's had a steady career. I'm pretty sure she's still in. Oh, yeah. I mean, she's. Time, so. But she's. Never anything as big as Nancy. No, she no doesn't. Lead roles she doesn't anything. have, unfortunately, the same kind of legacy as, like, uh, Jamie Lee Curtis. Yeah, I'm going to have a hot take here, though, but I think she's a better actress than Jamie Lee Curtis. I'm, is. I'm inclined to agree with you. 
you actually. Well, I, I think I think Jamie Lee Curtis has shown her talents in roles outside of horror films. As yeah. a horror actress, I'd say Heather Langenkamp is better. She's got but... more of a chance to though. Yes. Yeah. Unlike no, Heather Langenkamp. I mean, all the performances are are good. I don't know how old any of them were when this was being made, but certainly Heather Langenkamp was twenty. Yeah, they're pretty and, believable. Yeah, as there's a joke in the movie where she's supposed to be fifteen, but she looks in a mirror after being deprived of sleep for a couple of days, and she's like, "God, I look like I'm 20. <laughs> oh, I didn't notice that. Yeah, oh, that's, and that's she actually good. was twenty when making this that's movie. Good. Yeah, it was funny, and also I was like, oh, fuck off. (laughs) Fuck off, you look 20. I wish I was 20 again. (laughs) No, but, like, all of the characters really shine in this movie. Even, like, the, the sheriff dad... Yeah, who's the uh, the same Ray Liotta looking detective from uh, Black Christmas? Yeah, yes, right. uh, I guess he got pigeonholed. Uh, yeah, all right, got typecast in a way. Yeah, he's like <laughs> the pensive, thoughtful detective who's willing to listen. And <laughs> he's he's good though. I I thought he was good in Black Christmas, and I yeah. think he's good in this too. Oh, yeah. The drunk mom is great. Oh yes. Well, see, um, that's that's one thing that I was thinking throughout the film there's a good amount of detail put into all these side characters even the parents and the um well the 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 boyfriend of the first girl who gets murdered who is who's sleeping in bed with her when it happens and witnesses it and then of course is is framed for for the murder. He's more than just like uh, some broy side character that we don't give a shit about. Yes, yeah, so like we're introduced to him as as a bit of a. Oh yeah, he comes he does, like a football tackle. Yeah, he that. he like tackles Johnny Depp. He comes across very unlikable. Yes, but after like. He ends up getting framed for this murder that he absolutely did not commit, and he gets arrested. And like, you feel for him, yeah. You know? he's, like he's he's, he's panicked, a, he's scared. Yeah, like yeah. he's a he's a douche, but he does not like he witnessed something truly horrible and then is blamed for it and doesn't have a good explanation. Right. And you his know? demeanor changes from that point. Absolutely. Uh, and Nancy's then he's talking yeah. to him yeah. in the jail cell and it's, he's not acting like that anymore. He's, he's very concerned. So. Yeah. And she's the only one who will believe him. Yeah. You know? And for a screenplay written by Wes Craven as well, it seems that there's that care he doesn't want these characters to just be disposable. That you, you, you want to see them succeed in a way, or at, le- at the very least, to not die. Right. You're not waiting for them to die. And as I've mentioned before, that's something a lot of horror movies seem to have forgotten. It, to make yeah. You care. Characters are just fodder for the for the killer. Yeah. Right. It's well, characters, not I don't characters. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the things I think this movie really excels at is because, you know, all of these side characters, you don't get a ton of time with them, but they're still fleshed out enough where you you understand the characters without needing a bunch of exposition exactly. or like unnecessary scenes. I think the pacing of this movie is really tight. Yeah, overall. I agree. They have moments where they slow it down more. Uh, she, after being sleep deprived for multiple days, she goes to school and I really love the way they transition from that. There's a guy um, reading his book report, and once she realizes that she's in a dream, the man starts. He's whispering, and it's just it. It's very eerie. That whole well, yeah, that's that's something we should definitely talk about. Is that this movie does an awesome job of transitioning from reality to dream and in between without it being like blatant it takes you a second to realize that you've entered into the dream with the character just sort of like when you fall asleep like there's no there's no like moment where you go from being awake to asleep like it's a it's a gradual transition like that moment you're talking about where we hear something's wrong and the way the the kid reading the book report is uh is talking and then Nancy looks up and sees her friend like in the body bag standing at the door which great visual as yeah, well yeah really really oh. good 
and then follows her into the basement and then the basement transitions into that like it that like old dilapidated factory it's like there's a blend that i think works really really well and towards the end of the movie it really has you guessing is this a dream or is this the real world and if it is the real world does it really matter you yes. know yeah like it's uh there's there's nothing really certain um which i think is uh is really good right. yeah and well we uh near the end of the film we learn the backstory to freddy krueger and why he is murdering these children again all we really get in this movie in terms of backstory is it's revealed that freddy krueger was a uh serial killer who murdered children in like, something like killed 20 kids in yeah. this town which i did find a bit excessive because it's not they like a make, large town they want to make him irredeemable but man that's right also... but it's like okay he killed 20 kids and then like all of the parents got together and uh hunted him down yeah. and burned him well the to thing death. is you know he got he got caught he got off on the technicality Right, they say a search warrant wasn't signed or something. Yeah. They don't need to focus too much time right. on that. So, I mean, so the parents take matters into their own hands. And so uh, Freddy is uh, trying to get vengeance on the people who killed him by killing their children. Yeah. yeah. I thought it was just brief enough to explain without like getting too exposition heavy, which I think the, the remake... Has a problem with we'll, definitely which we'll gets too exposition about, heavy. I I did feel like that the explanation in the first one is it kind of left me wanting a little bit more in terms of like Freddy's motivations, but you know at the same time it's not really what it's about. Yeah. Like he's a fucking he's a fucking dream monster with yeah. knives for fingers. Well, the thing I loved and about a fedora, it is like, you know after the mother realized it was Fred Krueger. She, like, started hitting the bottle heavy. Oh, she got super drunk. I will say one of the things that flat out did not make any fucking sense to me is that Nancy's mom has been holding on to Freddy's glove all these years. Oh, the, yes. That's the yeah. glove that has the, the, the blades on it. Like, she goes into the attic and, like, gets it out, and she has it, like, wrapped in a piece of cloth. And I'm just like, why? Why do you have that? Why did you have that in the first place? And why have you been holding on to it all these years? Like, do you go up in the attic every now and then and just, like, look at the glove and be like, yeah, I burned this guy to death. <laughs> this is the this is the weapon that he used to murder children, and I burned him to death. Yeah, good memories. <laughs> Which is also it. that's a weird thing too, because that implies that while he was uh, like a human, a person, that he used his knife hands to murder kids. Which just feels right, well, very the, impractical. The it does, but. Also, it works, and I think it's something, especially at the time, better than just, like, a knife or a machete or a chainsaw, like, was super saturating the market at the time. Yeah, and, like, in the opening credits, we do see him, like, building the glove. Right. And, and that's fine. It is it is very impractical, but, like, Freddy is not a practical character no. by any means. Yeah. So it doesn't it doesn't bother me too much. No, it was one of those situations they didn't want to explain it too much, but they had to give something. Just right. So. Yeah. Before we uh, move on, let's uh, talk about the ending a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, Heather Lodgenkamp's character uh, Nancy, you know, realizes that the only way to kill Freddy is to take him out of the dream world. Yes, and the way that has to be done is by grabbing him while they're in a dream and waking up, uh, because she finds that she pulls his hat out of the dream. Yeah, earlier in the movie, uh, so she ends up pulling him out of the dream, and she set up plenty of booby traps up around her house, Home Alone style. Uh, that's that's another thing I like about this movie a lot is unlike most slasher movies where um, the the final girl or whatever is 
kind of ineffectual, doesn't do much except run from the killer. Like, Nancy decisively fights back. Yeah. And, like, at a certain point, she's even like, I'm not fucking afraid of you anymore. Like, she's she is, like, the true badass of this movie. Yeah. And she, yeah, I she totally sets up all these, like, Home Alone style traps at the end. I wonder if Home Alone got its ideas from Nightmare on Elm Street. Maybe. Because this movie did come first yeah um crap but you get some of the that. best effects in this whole sequence i think uh the the oatmeal stairs are uh oh yeah super oh, memorable yeah. a classic uh, uh of nightmare on elm street and also something that you could feel mm, that could happen in a nightmare or something You're oh trying yeah to run absolutely. away and yeah. the stairs are just well that's what i like so much about that because i I, I'm sure you guys have experienced this phenomenon too. Like when you're having a bad dream where you're being chased by someone or something, you feel like you're moving really slow. Yeah, yes. and yeah. like no matter how hard As you if you're force running yourself, through water. Or yeah, something. exactly. Yeah. And I think having the stairs turn into like goop and like start like pulling her feet down as she's trying to run up is a really great visual way to represent that feeling in nightmares that Absolutely. no matter how fast you're trying to go it's like you're wading through mud and you can't you can't escape and i think that that is uh really excellent yeah i will say the when uh freddy like gets to the mom and like she's like pulled into the bed i thought that was kind of a silly that one is a little bit uh, silly yeah uh, and uh but the the final scene once uh Nancy's apparently gotten rid of Freddy uh it like cuts to the morning uh and her mom's there and happily sending her off to school with her friends she gets in this convertible with her friends who and, are all alive again yeah and the convertible the top comes down and we see that it's red and brown like Freddy's uh sweater yeah and all of the doors lock and everything latches up and the car starts speeding away without them being able to do anything while these girls nearby are singing the one two freddy's coming for you uh nursery rhyme thing and and then the the mom gets uh pulled through the window on the door which is maybe one of the worst looking effects in the movie because it's obviously a mannequin and yeah. very very funny yeah it's very silly but honestly i love the ending to this movie i think oh it's great it's a great way to yeah end. having it you know maybe not be as happy of an ending as you would first expect is right. a great way to do it freddie turns into a car and a mannequin gets pulled through the window on a door. I love it. Yeah. Um, I guess we should, before we move on, uh, talk about Robert Englund as Freddy Krueger just a little bit. Oh, man. Just a, a career building role for Robert Englund, man. Like Yes. He, it, Freddy Krueger is iconic because of Robert England. Yeah, he's he does a really good job. He's so... Uh, he brings the right combination of silliness and menace that I think really has contributed to who Freddy Krueger is as a villain. Um, apparently, he based his performance really heavily on uh, Klaus Kinski from Werner Herzog's Nosferatu remake. Huh. Um, at least the way he stood and moved. Uh, he he thought that that was a, a very inspiring film and an inspiring performance by Kinski, which I agree. That's one of my favorite movies. I would not have thought about that until I read about it, and I think that that's uh, really interesting. He does a, he does a great job. He, yeah, he is Freddy Krueger, truly an iconic slasher villain. But yeah, he he brings such a unique charm to the character. That you don't really get with many other slasher villains. Well, right, because like, most other slasher villains don't say anything. Yeah. They're just big, unstoppable uh, monsters with sharp objects, you know? But Freddy Krueger really requires a personality. Yeah. And, uh, and England does that. 
Well, the the really interesting well. thing is, you know, as the series goes on, he gets quippier and quippier and becomes a sillier character. But you know, even in this movie, I I feel like it it hits a weird, awesome balance between like what you were saying, like having a menacing character and almost a character you kind of root for at the same time. A little bit. You see, so fun to watch. Just just a great role. Well, the franchise is nothing without Freddy Krueger. Oh, absolutely. So, um, I have a, a an interesting relationship with this franchise because I never saw any of these movies as a kid. The only three that I've seen are the ones that we're talking about on the show today. And uh, the the remake was the first one that I saw. I didn't see this original one until my freshman year of college. So I look at this franchise totally devoid of nostalgia. So I think that definitely impacts the way I see all of these movies, but I still think that this first one is uh, incredibly solid, like really, really good, subverting the, the genre in the state that it was when it was made. And I mean, obviously, the the lasting effects are apparent to everybody. Like, even growing up, I knew who Freddy Krueger was. I had never seen any of the movies, but I knew who he was. Yeah. Just because he's such a part of the culture at this point. Just like Michael Myers, just like Jason Voorhees, just like Leatherface. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know about you guys, but... Seeing Freddy Krueger was creepy as a kid. Yeah, for me. Yeah. Well, my first exposure to him was was my uh, some older kids, friends of my brother. They were watching Friday, uh, no, Freddy versus Jason, and I just uh, watched a little bit of it. Knew that Freddy Krueger was someone who killed you in your dreams, and that freaked me out. I didn't want to go to bed because I thought, well, I can't do anything in my dreams. I'm going to be helpless. And yeah, exactly. I, it's it's scary as a kid, you know, because you're always afraid of the monster under your bed or in your closet. But once you fall asleep, everything's okay. Right. Whereas Fred with Freddy. Like, you're never safe from Freddy because no matter what, you have to sleep. At some point, you will sleep no matter how long you keep yourself awake. So there's really no way to stay away from him. He can get you anywhere. Yeah, my... And uh, that's that's scary. My mom uh, was trying to comfort me and she's like, if anyone was here to hurt you, I would be able to stop them. And I remember telling her, no, you can't. You can't save me in my you dreams. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up, Mom. You can't save me in my dreams. You don't understand the complexities of Freddy Krueger as a character. I do, and I'm seven. <laughs> um, apparently, also, this is super random, but Heather Langenkamp's boyfriend at the time of making this movie uh, is the one who came up with the iconic uh, Freddy nursery rhyme. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. Oh. We should probably jump into ratings. Yes. Uh, As I said, I don't know if a lot of the horror moments really got to me. There are a few very effective parts. Um, the kills really is where this the, the, the film shines with trying to create all of these, these gory, bloody set pieces. Just through talking about it, though, it sort of shifted my feelings on it. I think that it does have so many positives to it, like the concepts, the acting, all the characters, something that it has unlimited power to kill you in any way they please. That's something truly sinister to me, uh, being toyed around with. I think it executes all that very well. I think I'm going to have to give it a four and a half for that. All right. Um. Yeah, I I agree with you, what you said for the most part. I, like I said, don't have any nostalgia towards this film. Um, it's the major horror franchise that I have seen the least of. I still think it's a very good movie, and for what it has created, it's definitely uh, worth the recognition. But at the same time, even having seen it a couple of times now, it still doesn't have quite the same impact for me as like Toby Hooper's Texas Chainsaw Massacre or like uh, Black Christmas, which I know I keep going back to a lot. But so for me, I'm going to have to give it a, a very solid four out of five pods. Great movie, 
but maybe not as uh, scary today as it would have been back in the day, just considering its sort of campy legacy, I suppose. Yeah, well, honestly, for me, this is a perfect slasher movie. Um, It injects a perfect amount of creativity that was needed for the genre. It's uh, perfectly crafted, in my opinion. The story is very tight. Pacing is really solid. There's a solid amount of scares without even resorting to things like jump scares. Conceptually, the idea of being stuck in your dreams and losing the agency of your own dreams is actually really scary. I think Freddy Krueger is one of the most iconic horror villains of all time. And while, you know, I I agree the, the film might not be as visceral as Texas Chainsaw or Black Christmas... It definitely still holds up, in my opinion. I think the general conceit of the movie is is timeless in how, you know, getting killed in your dreams by this entity is a truly scary thought. Honestly, one of my favorite slasher movies, and I'm going to give it a five out of five. Well, that gives us an average rating of 4.5 pods. All right, so now we're going to move on to the uh, remake of Nightmare on Elm Street. came out in 2010, directed by Samuel Bayer, who has not done anything else of note. Uh, he's another music video He's a music guy. video guy. He did, uh, he did the music video for Zombie by the Cranberries oh, and nice. uh, did some stuff for Iron Maiden and Nirvana and Metallica. I think he uh, still does music videos. I think he now, does right? too. Uh, couldn't, couldn't break definitely that. Definitely a industry. music video style. Marilyn, yeah, Marilyn Manson music videos, Smashing Pumpkins, uh, Green Day, Blink-182, yeah, he's oh man, he's this done, guy's cool. He's <laughs> done guy. he's done a shitload of uh, of music videos, but not a whole lot of films. I remember going to see this movie in theaters when it came out in 2010, which I guess would have made me 16, 15, 16, and uh, I thought it was the tits back then. It now has, it's it now has it's... not aged super well. I will go ahead and say that I don't think this is a trash movie. I don't think it's that bad, but it is incredibly uninspired. It's basically note for note the original, but doesn't do anything fun like well, the original are, does. There are a couple things they try and do separate from the original, but those all bit. feel like negatives to the film it's honestly than... yeah like every creative choice they make in a different direction than the original doesn't work for me no. I, I'll it's say. it's a very it's a very bleak gritty dark remake most of the humor of nightmare on elm street is gone i will say the only thing that makes this movie that saves this movie from being uh totally unwatchable for me is uh jackie earl haley yeah. oh yes he must well, have been hot off the heels of his rorschach performance which, which is the only thing that makes uh watchmen not be completely yeah. unwatchable the Unwatchmanable. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like Zack Snyder totally missed the point of that whole character. Oh, in the he movie. absolutely did, but, but Jackie Earl Haley kills it. He's yeah. literally the only good thing about that entire movie. Yeah. And he's about the only good thing about this movie, yeah. too. Yeah. The problem is is that he's stepping into the shoes of Robert Englund. Yeah, and I who don't has think had, he's nearly as good as Robert Englund. He's different. He's good in different ways, but it's definitely not the same Freddy Krueger. Before we get into that, we'll do basic plot overview. Do we even need Yeah, I, mean, I don't even almost, know if we need to. It's, it's almost point for point the same yeah, story as the original. Yeah, basically... 
we can talk about the opening scene because that sets a pretty bad tone for the rest of the movie. Oh yeah, God. I think. that that really upset me. That I scene. I it, really didn't. I really yeah, don't like uh, the opening begins. scene. So yeah, we start in a fifties diner that's super neon heavy. For yeah, some which reason. is a weird combination. Like the I feel 50s like that's aesthetic a, with like neon. That's a music video director. We, we sort of set thing. up the. It does look like a music. Yeah, yeah we colorful. set up the. This is a dream, guys. Let's <laughs> emphasize that this is a dream. Yes, it's very, very right over from the get go. Um, right, there's a there's a guy who's like chugging coffee to try to stay awake, but he keeps falling asleep, and uh, he ends up being attacked by Freddy, and uh, seemingly cuts his own throat with a steak knife in front of his uh, his friend. Uh, I know it's not his girlfriend because she's with a different dude right, later no, just on. A, just a friend. Yeah, and mm-hmm. uh, it sets up all the main characters right at the beginning. But just how, like we talked about in the original, there's not that opening setup kill. Yes. That's exactly what they do in this one. Is exactly. they do they do the setup kill and that starts these uh these kids beginning to investigate the the strange death of their friend and then they start dying too. It also sets up the gritty tone of this movie, which I think is one of the worst elements of it. Like, oh, yeah, let's make it gritty and somewhat realistic. Make a fucking Freddy Krueger Dream World movie, gritty and realistic. You right. Know, well, terrible are, decision. One problem, like in the original, there are moments of humor. Moments that say, okay, these are just a bunch of teenagers goofing around. Where in this, it's a bunch of 30 year olds who seem yes. to hate themselves. Yeah. That's and- a, we might as well get into that is that none of these actors look even remotely like teenagers, no. which is something that we've talked about before and seems to be a problem. But I don't know what it is, but like in the original like heather langenkamp and johnny depp were like 20 21 playing 15 16 year olds but they pulled it off whereas these folks uh who i ended up looking up a lot of their ages at the time of this movie because i was so curious these people are all like 23 24 and don't look a day under that. And yeah. they're supposed to be 16-year-olds. They look late 20s. They no, look there's, the thing. There's scenes they're talking with their parents, and they look like they're siblings. Yeah, they, so- they look like they're not much younger than their parents. <laughs> right. And Green I don't... Mara looks like... Eight years old, uh, younger than Connie Britton. <laughs> I will say Rooney Mara looks the youngest out of all of these people. Yeah, and, and she, she and she, she still and she still looks like she's in her twenties. Yeah. Well, because she was, she was twenty three when they made this movie. Right, in which I I understand Jackie Earl Haley, you know, being pulled into this, and I guess Rooney Mara hadn't had any big roles yet. She wasn't in Girl with a Dragon Tattoo at that point. That no, that came made. out a year or two later. So. This is the first thing that I remember seeing Rooney Mara. Right. She was in. in the Social Network, I, which I around the still same haven't time. seen. But I don't that's know if that's it came a small bit after. role. Yeah, it well. is a small bit role, but, but a crucial one. Yeah, um, but in this but, one, uh, apparently this movie almost made her want to quit acting, which... Oh, jeez. I'm glad I, she didn't. She's yeah, good. Yes, no, I she's not. a fantastic actor, and it's a shame that she had to get roped up into this, because she is truly better than having to play the lead in this uh yeah. in this horror movie. Yeah. Well, basically this movie hits all of the major plot points of the original. Some of the scenes even virtually exactly the same yeah. but done to worse effect that's the thing they miss the mark so hard especially with the gritty tone of it because they don't understand what to play from the hip and what to go more stylistic with in my opinion right. i think they have because in the original they they kind of blend that a little bit where in they play the the difference between reality and dream states by the hip you know you can't necessarily always tell what's a dream and what's not but the kills themselves are very out there and right. dreamy where is in this one the kills are all super uninspired and they always there's always a st- dark contrast between the waking world and the dream world it's always like the lighting always changes like when in that diner scene at the beginning when the the guy falls asleep 
as he's like as his head is nodding down all of the lights dim in the diner and the neon comes up it's like oh so this is a dream now yeah. it's like there's no subtlety and they do that throughout the rest of the movie yeah. there's not a single time in this movie where you question whether somebody's dreaming or awake it's always either they're awake they're dreaming all of that subtle effectiveness from the first one is just gone and like when the chris character who uh she looks like the oldest out of all of them like when she gets killed there's not like her being dragged across the ceiling that really prolonged effective scene from the original she's just flying around on some strings around the bedroom and then gets slashed and dies right they ramp that shit up to 100 and she's sm- she smacks her boyfriend in the face she's knocking over lamps like it's it's almost like a comedy bit that's happening where in the first one it's meant to try and genuinely unsettle you and it, and it's prolonged in the first one too whereas in this one it's just kind of like eh whatever I feel like this movie was made by a person who didn't get the horror of the original it almost feels like he's watching and he's like oh these bits are so boring I want to try and make them actually scary for a modern audience and survey shows modern audiences don't like to be confused <laughs> they like everything spoon right. fed to them so exactly and this movie does spoon feed everything yeah, to you it's so heavy it's, hand, heavy it's hand lazy hand. that's really what it comes down to is this movie's just lazy it doesn't do anything uh, unique or different And considering that you're playing with dream logic where literally anything can happen, Freddy just kills people by slicing them and stabbing them, you know? like Yeah, it's such a waste of potential. You can literally do anything with the Freddy Krueger character. And instead of being creative with it, they end up falling back to either slashing or stabbing or rehashes of kills from the original movie. Yeah. And it's just so uninspired because even the rehashes of the original movie kills, they don't do them as effectively. They miss the point. I mean, the girl spinning around in the room is one of the greatest examples of that yeah, you know absolutely and you know what jackie earl haley is really he's doing his best and god bless him for it like he's trying to to make something out of this movie but everything around him is just so lackluster yeah. but i really appreciate his willingness to commit to the character and to try to be good Whereas a lot of other actors would just phone it in as like a paycheck movie, you know? The thing that frustrates me the most about Freddy Krueger in this movie is the makeup, honestly. It, it doesn't look because, as good as the original. Yeah, no. honestly, they, they push the burnt element, you know, the, the, the third degree burns on his face so right. hard that his face just is so static in the movie. It's, There's it, no expressiveness. Yeah, he's expressive. And part of the reason I think Freddy Krueger in the originals was so effective is because there was such an expressiveness to his face. And Robert England really pushed that. Whereas Jackie Early Haley, while he's definitely menacing in this movie... Yes, he, he's you know, very good at that. He's limited by what he can show with his face. His, his vocal performance is solid, and I think that's something that comes from the Watchmen character too because you know Rorschach wears a mask so the majority of his performance is based on his voice and his movements and it's very much the same in this one because he's working with such uh, lame looking prosthetics that he can't do anything with his face Yeah, and so he really leans heavily into the vocal performance and I think he does a good job and he is good at being menacing but most of the kookiness to the character is gone although I will say he is quippier than I remember the quips are just not as uh and they're not funny. They're not. They're yeah, not they're as outrageous. Not that funny. I, we, they, they we, we laughed, more straight we laughed face a few times too. Well, like when he before he kills Chris and like she goes outside and sees like the dead dog, and then Freddy Krueger steps out. And he's like, "I was just petting him," and he holds up the knife hands. I thought I don't. I thought that was pretty yeah, funny. It, it it gets a little goofy, but it doesn't feel like. It should be in this movie because it's they very, play it so gritty. It feels kind of alien to the it's tone. It's at they, odds they with yeah. 
Because they obviously are trying to keep more to the serious tone of the original, more so than any of the sequels, right. but to interject it with the humor that's been established from all the sequels, it's it's just... Distro- it's- it- it's it jarring. Yeah. It's tonally jarring. I agree with you. It still makes me laugh, and I was thankful for those moments because at those moments I felt like I really needed a laugh. But in the context of the film itself, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Yeah. The the grittiness of the rest of the film does not cater towards Freddy being a goofy character. And so those moments of goofiness are just like, well... That doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. You I know? feel more like more than anything is just fan service to fans. I think of so. Series. One thing I want to talk about. Uh, one of the biggest moves they make that's different than the original is the whole Freddy Krueger backstory. Yes, they, they go really into much go more into detail. it in this one. Uh, biggest thing is instead of a child killer, uh, he's a child molester, which I guess he was supposed to be in the original. But they had to change because there was some big controversy at the time around uh, child molesters in California. But they really dig into the backstory. They show lengthy footage. Of- yeah, it's there's way too much exposition. I don't mind him being a child molester rather than a killer. It feels a little bit more grounded uh, for like a human character, which he is before he becomes the nightmare monster. But the just the way they do it and the fucking exposition dump is just so overdone and so unnecessary. They stumble over it so badly to the point where it seems like they're trying to make you sympathize with right. well, Freddy Krueger. We, we learn that all of the kids who were dying were in the same like preschool class where Freddy Krueger was like the gardener or whatever and he was like super friendly with all the kids and apparently had been molesting them and they had uh, repressed those memories and so when the parents found out about it, same deal. They chased down Freddy Krueger and burned him in a factory, which is why his uh, dream domain is that factory. But the sympathy aspect of it is really weird because they try to start implying at a certain point that he wasn't molesting them. Yeah, and that the like kids, it was a collective lie That or the something. kids had all gotten together and made that up, like the uh, like Rooney Mara's uh, love interest character at one point starts yelling, like, you killed him! Like, we were kids, we would have said anything! Like, you killed an innocent man! And they try to build up all this sympathy for Freddy Krueger, and then at the end they're like, oh, well, yeah, he actually was molesting the yeah, kids. Yeah, I didn't it's understand like, well, that at all. Why would you do that? Why, yeah, why would they try to build sympathy? It's yeah. like, we know from the beginning that he's molesting them, and then they try to make it like he's not, but I they never almost, I never buy they that. They almost try to act like the, the high school kids are at fault for this somehow. Right, I, I thought it was a terrible move. Right, like Freddy Krueger is not a sympathetic character, yeah. and he shouldn't be. And yeah, I, and I mean, even though he's quippy at times, you know, there's still a menace to the character throughout the whole series. And I, yeah, and I will say that that is the one thing that this movie does right, and it is the the menace of the character. He is extremely menacing, and I buy it. And once again, that is due pretty much entirely to Jackie Earl Haley's performance. One thing that I actually did legitimately enjoy in this movie, just a little detail, is uh, how he like r- rubs two of his finger knives together when he's like stalking people and it's got like scraping sound. Yeah. I, I actually found that pretty uh legitimately menacing and stuff like that is good but it doesn't do anything it's so disappointing that they fall back so often to jump scares in the movie as well yes absolutely there's an excessive amount of jump scares where no one's killed nothing really happens they just woo see freddy uh there's lots of jump scares and they're extremely uh they just forecasted yep yep 
Um, you know, and like, it's that's the problem with modern horror movies. Is they they think that jump scares equal horror, and that's not the case. I think it's interesting we should mention just the horror movie landscape for this movie when it came out compared to Nightmare on Elm Street. I mean, you had the Halloween remake. That was 2009. Right? Uh, no, that was 2007. 2007, uh, okay. Uh, Friday the 13th Friday remake 13th was, 2009. was 2009. 2009. I'm pretty sure there was a Texas Chainsaw. Well, I guess there's a Texas Chainsaw movie made like every three years. Yeah. But there there was one around that time, too. Right. This I was, think it was the be- Texas Chainsaw at the beginning. This was definitely like uh, in the landscape of rebooting classic horror franchises. Right. I think even the, the Hills of Eyes, that was like 2006 or something, 2007. I think I think the first one was was earlier than that. Really? It was like oh. 2003 or 4. Oh, but wow. Shit. Regardless. But, uh, yeah, the yeah. the kind of movies that were coming out at that point, a a lot of franchise restarting. Nightmare on Elm Street seems to ride that similar wave where they want to try and reignite whatever it was that made these films popular in the first place, but ultimately just being a shell of what made the first movie so good. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Well, like we said, they haven't done anything new or original with it to revitalize that interest. You know, it's just it's just a, a generic reboot. It's the same story. It hits all the same points, um, but it delves in more into the killer's backstory, just like the Halloween remake. Which I always hate. I think all yeah. of that only serves to weaken leaving remember. it to the imagination is always more effective in my opinion i think so too the the problem with this movie is every every move they make like i said before is just in service of making the movie worse all the jump scares added all the bad cgi versus uh, practical oh, yeah. effects yeah like they do the like, they do the same thing as in the original where uh, Rooney Mara's character is falling asleep and Freddy is like in the wall behind her. But in this one, they use CG instead of practical effects and it looks like the fucking Frighteners. Yeah, I was gonna say. Yeah. It looks like the fucking Frighteners, which came out 14 years prior to this or something like that. And it just looks bad. And there's no excuse for a film that came out 30 years before this one to have better effects. And There's no excuse. Yeah, and a series like sad. Nightmare on Elm Street, where throughout all of them, there are a lot of great creative deaths that use a lot of practical effects. I'm thinking like Freddy Krueger as the TV smashing the woman into the screen or being the giant snake swallowing up a a woman. I think the series has always sort of reveled in that practical effects, actually seeing that creature physically in that in that moment, just to add on to that visceral dream horror Right. And to make those moments CGI just, uh, it's it's a problem with a lot of movies out there and today they, that use it. It's fake. And, and they try artificial. to, they try to bring back the same kind of feeling of like the, the oatmeal stairs from the first one, except in this one, Rooney Mara's running down a hallway and the floor turns into blood and she's like wallowing yeah. around in it. And you know, I must say, I'm not at all surprised that Samuel Bayer is a music video guy because Aside from the f- the moments of really cheap looking CGI, a lot of it looks really nice. Um, there are some really cool visual moments. The lighting is all you know pretty damn good, um, but it looks like a music video where it's like the visuals are just in service of the music rather than the visuals being in service of the story, which is really what it needs. Right. Yeah. Well, hey, it's it's a point that even goes back to a movie like The Snowman. You could do everything uh, to the nines in terms of production. Everything looks great, sounds great, but if you don't have anything worth telling, it's then hollow. It's, yeah. it's hollow yeah. and empty. When, you know, the biggest uh, sin a Nightmare on Elm Street movie can make, in my opinion, is being boring. Yes. And this one is kind of boring. It's kind of boring, yeah. When you have the possibility to do anything with the character of Freddy Krueger, with Dream Logic, it just seems like such a waste to make such a boring 
generic movie. That's its biggest problem. Yeah, I think so too. I would not even go so far as to say that it's a bad movie. It's just uninspired and uh, and hollow feeling and kind of boring. Considering the legacy of A Nightmare on Elm Street, it absolutely does not do that justice by any means. I Maybe it's just because I don't have the nostalgia goggles on that I don't find it too offensively bad, but it's just, it's just, eh, it's just I very... I don't even know, though, because, you know, like, one Halloween back in high school, I watched through the whole series of Nightmare on Elm Street all in a row. You know, one through six, New Nightmare... And then uh, Freddy vs. Jason, and finally the remake. And even Freddy vs. Jason, you know, even though that one isn't great, it's more entertaining. You know, they do more creative things with it, with the Freddy character, than they do in this one. Like I said, uh, Jackie Earl Haley saves this movie from being uh, truly bad, I think. Uh, his, his, His performance makes it watchable if not good watchable he's the only one trying. he's okay he's he yeah he's the only one trying and right. i think that's because i i remember hearing that he got his uh role as rorschach uh through like a, he sent in like a youtube video of his audition so he was a totally unknown you know and well he was a child actor before he actually went up for the role that Johnny Depp got in the original but his career had certainly petered out at that point I mean, he was in Little Children I mean he was nominated for an Academy Award that was back in 2005 so and I think I think that's what makes his performances in this and Watchmen good is because he knows that he needs to be good to stay relevant right. and so he really throws his all into it and it's a shame that he's been in these kind of trash movies because he's always trying so hard and i respect the hell out of him for that and i wish that he would be in a movie where he actually gets a chance to shine with like a good director and well, like a was, good story I, he had a bit role in lincoln and he still I, which, I, which i didn't say I, yeah I, the last thing i saw him in was he had a bit part in the dark tower and oh, in that really? in that one he was phoning it in like a motherfucker oh, but i don't no. i don't know how anybody could not be in that movie like <laughs> Here I go talking about the fucking Dark Tower. But like <laughs> Idris Elba and Matthew McConaughey, both legitimately great actors, both give super phoned in performances. They obviously don't give a fuck. Neither of them are good in that movie. Nobody is good in the Dark Tower. It's a bad fucking yeah. movie. And well, that's a- well, before we get too <sighs> off track, let's uh, jump into ratings. For before this one. before we do, while we're on the subject of Jackie Earl Haley, the best line in this movie is when he has Rooney Mara trapped in the dream and he's about to kill her and she's like screaming for the other guy to wake her up and he's like, your boyfriend can't save you. I'm your boyfriend now. (laughs) That was my... (laughs) That's my favorite part of that whole movie. I'm your boyfriend now (laughs) is the best line in the fucking movie. That was pretty funny. Yeah, he like he like licks her face. I'm your boyfriend now. All right, yeah. So let's too uh, little, too late. Too little, too late. Yeah, exactly. Let's jump into ratings. Uh, I guess I'll start. Yeah. You know, the biggest sin for me in a nightmare movie is being boring, and this movie is boring in my opinion. The grittiness doesn't work. You know, they they make all of the wrong moves. I think. it's, it's just such a waste of potential to not be creative with the kills in a nightmare movie when you can do literally anything. I agree Jackie Earl, Earl Haley was pretty good in it, but not even he could save it in my opinion because I think the Freddy Krueger makeup did him a huge disservice and I think it really limited his performance. The fact that they tried to sympathize uh, make Freddy almost a sympathetic character was one of the worst decisions you could have made. You know, it's not the worst remake we've ever had, but it's not a good remake. And if you compare it to any of the Fre- Nightmare on Elm Street movies, even the sequels, I don't think it stands up nearly as much. So I'm going to have to give it a one and a half out of five. Well, if you 
find that you're not a fan of older horror movies because you think they're too slow and horror movies today are cooler because they're louder and they have more jump scares. If those are in your wheelhouse, I would recommend checking out this new uh, night this Nightmare on Elm Street remake. Otherwise, just go check out the original. The original does everything in this movie better and actually gets you thinking about uh, certain stuff, just about that dream and reality mix where in this it's not challenging you at all. So I'm going to have to give it two stars. I, as much as I will defend this movie as not a terrible movie, I basically think there's no reason you should see this over the original. Like, if you have the option, like, just watch the original. It's a much better film and will satisfy you much more than this one does. I'll reiterate, basically, Jack Earl Haley is the only reason to watch this movie. If he wasn't in it, it would be maybe the most boring thing ever i saw that apparently robert england gave his blessing to jack earl haley as the new freddy he said and i quote that the torch has been well passed so even robert england liked his performance but man other than that there's not a whole lot this movie does all that well um it just uh steals a lot of stuff from the original to much diminished effect and uh, for that reason, I'm going to give it a 2.5. So a solid 2 overall uh, for Nightmare on Elm Street remake. Yeah. Um, and yeah, just watch the original. Yeah, Don't. just watch the original. I think that's pretty much where we're always at, is just watch the original when you yeah. have a chance. There's yeah. only a handful of remakes that are worth it. And I'm sure we'll talk about some of those at length at some point, you know, like The Thing or The Fly. Yeah, definitely. But, um, um, but let's uh, let's wrap up with a discussion of Wes Craven's New Nightmare yes. from 1994. I wanted to select this movie because with the remake, I thought this was a good middle ground between something that wasn't remaking anything, but was trying to revive the series in a way. At this point, the last movie was the sixth one, Freddy's Dead. They kill off the character, and that was supposed to be that. In this movie, it has a very meta take on the Nightmare on Elm Street series. We are actually following Heather Loggenkamp, the actress from the first film, as a new production of Nightmare on Elm Street is starting, and while this is happening, strange deaths begin to occur all around her, uh, giving her the impression that Freddy Krueger the character from the movie she starred in almost 20 years ago is immer is oh, it putting ten, himself into the real world only 10 years ago only 10 years prior to this oh one. yeah you're right right cuz this came cuz this came out in 94 94 so ten, right 10 years after which is crazy that that means there were 6 five prequels oh, yeah. uh, before this one within a 10 year yeah. span that's almost a film every year yeah well the one thing i'll say about it is I think this is the best seventh entry into any series. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can I can probably agree with that. Yeah, you really only you really only got Friday the thirteenth and Halloween. I guess you have the Hellraiser movies. Well, shit, uh, you got the Leprechaun yeah. movies, and then you got the Saw. Saw. Okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah. This is I I think that's. Uh, would not be incorrect to say that this is the best seventh. It's installment. such a fresh take. Uh, into a series that had gotten to the point of being almost a parody of itself. Yes. Well, the, the thing time. it does well is it's not, it's a reboot, but it's not a soft reboot. It's not recreating the first movie by any means. No. But what it is doing is bringing the Nightmare on Elm Street template and putting it into this world where Freddy Krueger exists as a movie character, playing around with that idea of the monster himself from the films and how it affects our own lives, what it represents. Yeah, well, what's really interesting to me is right after this, uh, Wes Craven went on to make Scream. Yes, right, right. Uh, and is... in a lot of ways, this feels like a proto-Scream. Absolutely. It's, it's very apparent that at this time in his life, uh, Wes Craven was really focused on like what makes a horror film a horror film. Yeah. Very reflective on the genre and on its tropes. 
and uh, I think this film is a is a a great precursor to Scream. I would almost consider them like sister films. Yeah. Well, the one of the things that makes me respect this movie even more than Scream is this movie does that meta kind of commentary, you know, that self awareness without falling back into broad comedy at all. Yeah. You well, know, it plays it fairly straight. It While does. there's definitely silly parts in it, they don't go as far for the humor as they do in the Scream movies? No, no, not at all. And a lot of this movie is a pretty slow burn in terms of the kills that we see. There are a good amount sprinkled throughout the film, but a lot of it is just focused on Heather Lagenkamp's struggle with this. Um, she's also getting phone calls, which we assume to be Freddy Krueger as well, and just uh, harassing phone calls that increase throughout the film. Yeah, weird stuff is starting to yeah. happen, and she right. she seems to be, her character seems to be kind of haunted by uh, her role in the Nightmare on Elm Street movies, um, which I think is interesting, because like, that's what everyone knows her for, and she seems like she's wanting to... Uh, you know, move beyond that, but she can't shake those movies. Right. But in this movie, that that idea manifests itself as like a like a real physical threat in the form of Freddy Krueger. That part is really interesting to me and in how self reflexive it is. Because mm -hmm. I feel like all of the main real life people in the movie have been haunted in a way. Sure. At the time, especially by the Nightmare on Elm Street series. You know, you had the 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 sheriff came back. Yeah, uh, well, yeah, you've got all these people playing themselves. Robert Saxon as the sheriff and John Saxon. John Saxon, John Saxon sorry, Saxon. Uh, Robert England. Robert I England combined them. Yeah, John Saxon plays himself with really cool sunglasses. With very cool sunglasses. <laughs> uh, Wes Craven <laughs> plays himself. Obviously, it revolves around Heather Langenkamp as herself. Uh, her husband in the movie is her actual husband in real life, and he is a special effects artist as he is in the movie the kid is not is obviously not her real kid i will um, say the kid gives a great performance in really movie, i though. would say he gives an absolutely terrible performance really <laughs> yeah oh my god there's so many times where like his facial expressions are just laughably over exaggerated like i know he's a child like i'm not trying to make fun of the acting talent of a child but the kid is the worst performance in the movie See, I, as far I, as bought, I bought the kid i, I mean i don't <laughs> I'm sort of on the fence. I thought that in terms of lines, he delivered them pretty well. His lines are yeah, fine, yeah. But yeah. Anytime I saw him screen, he reminded me of, like, Macaulay Culkin and yeah, Home Alone or yeah. something. So, But that's just, uh, you You can't blame the kid too much for his well, right. facial he's expressions. A, he's, the fact a, that, he's a child. Yeah, yeah. The fact that he could deliver his dialogue um, with enough care is that's I'll, I'll give him enough credit for yeah. that what did you guys think of the special effects in this movie because they do have a little bit of cgi but for the most part it is practical effects i i thought all of the practical effects are pretty great uh I will say, hot take, I think that uh, the Freddy makeup in this is worse than in even the remake. I think Freddy looks really bad in this movie. It looks like, it doesn't look like prosthetics like applied to Robert Englund's face. It looks like a rubber mask. It almost looks a little too clean. Yes, Yes, you know? it it doesn't it doesn't look like it's like raw burned flesh like dripping ooze yeah. and stuff like it has I, a, it it looks very very fake. Yeah, I I'll, I give it a little bit of a pass just because it's such an iconic design. Yeah, but I think that but that's. I, Honestly, I think that makes it more inexcusable to look as bad as yeah, it does yeah. is because it is such an iconic design and they've done it so well prior to this movie. Like, it f it looks lazy. I had no issue with it, actually. It really, and I it think really it, bothers me. I think it looked much better than in the remake where Jackie Earl Haley looks like a like a naked bull rat or something. Well, yeah, yeah, but I think I th I'm glad that it was expressive. It was at least yeah. expressive. It did have yeah. that. I'll agree with you on that one. But at least Jackie Earl Haley his makeup looked like he was an actual burn victim even though he can't really do much with his face whereas this one it, it just looked it looked cheap and fake and clean 
to me. And I, well, I guess my that's, issue, that's, it's beside the point. It's not that big of a deal. Freddy but... Krueger's never actually looked like much of a burn victim to me. Even in the original one, he just I looks like he, a, he looks like a guy with eczema or something. <laughs> just really bad skin. Yeah, just lots and of so, pock marks. I guess I, I, I did not mind the sort of... Uh, updated version they did for this film and again it's supposed to be that he's you know that he's coming back in a new way they even show in the beginning uh which we find out is actually on the set of the new nightmare on elm street film they're making which turns out to also be a dream of heather lock and cams but it begins with freddy krueger creating the new knife hands that we see well it's it's a robot hand actually because he cuts his own hand off and so Back to the the practical effects, uh, I think overall they they turned out pretty well. Other than how kind of cheap Freddy looked, um, I actually loved the the set pieces of this movie too. I thought same her falling into the coffin was really cool. I I like too how uh, midway through the movie when it starts to become like blurred whether the movies are like canon or if she's in the movie and we get that part where she comes out of her house and it's the house from from the nightmare on Mm -hmm. elm street movies whereas when she goes in it's like her house and like that's a a really cool transition yeah Um, um should we should we talk about uh before we get into stuff towards the ending should we talk about why this stuff is starting to happen in supposedly the real world like why freddy krueger is seeping into heather langenkamp's life sure yeah well this is the moment that really if you're on board for that kind of meta stuff like this is when it really gets uh complicated because we find out that Wes Craven is creating this new Nightmare on Elm Street because the Force, whatever it is, Freddy Krueger himself is apparently an ancient evil that has always been around and has existed in many forms. And the only way, or the way to try and subdue this creature is through storytelling, to try and cement him in some way. You trap it in a story. Right. And it's existed as Freddy Krueger for such a long time that it has decided to continue to manifest itself as Freddy Krueger. And so Wes Craven is writing a new film in order to keep it contained. And that new film is this film. A great commentary on the state of Nightmare on Elm Street at that point. So he's saying, the movies have been so goofy. Everyone, as he he says, like, everyone knows the rules. And so it takes something fresh and new again. It's cool. I actually really like the choice they made with that, you know? It it, it does it better than the new Amityville we saw in terms of trying to (laughs) do a meta commentary. Absolutely. It it really does succeed. Because it kind of hits at the idea of Freddy Krueger is this archetype of a bigger idea beyond the series. Right. Which I appreciated. Freddy Krueger as a character and the legacy of the Nightmare on Elm Street movies has sort of taken on a life of its own in many ways, just like, you know, everybody knows Freddy Krueger, even if they haven't seen the movies. And I like how this film's take on that is that it has literally taken on a life of its own. (laughs) My only problem with that is if this is supposed to be some like ancient demonic entity that has to be stopped, they do defeat him pretty easily. And he does not seem to be great at what he does, considering the final part of the film is mostly just 10 minutes of him like chasing a six-year-old around who seems to be pretty good at getting away from him. Yes. Yeah. Well, one thing we did not mention is a big conflict in the film is the child who is having weird dreams. He's acting very strangely. He has seizures. And there's a concern that it's it's a result of mental illness that runs in her family. But right. as, an, as an audience, we know it's Freddy Krueger tormenting him. And so the final battle occurs when Freddy Krueger kidnaps the child and Heather Loggenkamp has to go in and save her. And in a very cool transition 
from the reality to this movie reality, John Saxon is at her house to, and, you know, she assumes it as he's there to try and, like, you know, just make sure she's okay. Right. But as they're talking, we figure out that John, it's not John Saxon, the actor. Now it's John Saxon, the the father from the from Nightmare, Nightmare on Street series. Street. He's calling her Nancy. He drives away in his police car. He's got the badge on uh, on his, his belt. belt. I thought that transition was excellent. Yes, yeah. because I, I it's not blatant at all. It was just at one point while they're talking, he calls her Nancy and it's brushed off. And I noticed that. I'm like, was that a mistake? Like, did he call her Nancy on accident and they never address that and then he calls her nancy again and then she's like why are you calling me that and i'm like oh okay and then we see the belt or the badge on his belt and then he gets into his police car and then we see that she's in the house from the original and the way it just sort of like subtly eases that in there is awesome yeah it's really effective extremely effective it's the sort of thing that the remake needed yes just to try and blend between the reality and dream world, which this movie just we does yeah we really well. we needed the subtlety uh, for the remake that is just not there right and in that moment that is when she realizes again just like in the first Nightmare on Elm Street that she must dive into the dream world and kill Freddy Krueger and <laughs> save her son that that part is kind of funny though because the way she completes the transition is that. A big, a big like thematic thing about this movie is like Hansel and Gretel. Like that's like mm-hmm. uh, the little boy's favorite bedtime story or whatever. And so when he's been kidnapped by Freddy Krueger, he leaves her a trail of sleeping pills <laughs> that <laughs> that she follows into his bed and into like this tunnel. And she's just eating everyone she finds, and it's just like ooh sleeping pill, nom, nom, nom. ooh sleeping pill. Nom, nom, nom. Yeah. Yes, which is a little silly. The yeah, Hansel and Gretel silly. story, the 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 hunter that it's a hunter that finds him or something. I forget how Hansel and Gretel goes. Uh, no, they trick the they trick the oh, witch yes, right. into uh, like they and they shove her into they her own her oven. oven. I don't think they eat the breadcrumbs on their way back. No, <laughs> but, it's, but it's the idea of like it's a, she's following a trail. Right, and so the first order, one I got, but after she started popping them, yeah. then it was a little yes, goofy. The, I, I really enjoyed how the bed turned into like a slide. Yes, at a certain point, oh, and yes. then they sl- she slides into like uh, this like weird dream temple that has like a big Freddy Krueger face that she falls out of its yes. mouth. Now this is the point in the film where, depending on how much you enjoy the Nightmare on Elm Street series, it feels a bit masturbatory, like Wes Craven laying out this sort of throne or. A shrine to his character, just like, oh, look at this world I built up. Look how menacing his boiler room is. This I is- will, I will say honestly, this is the part where the movie gets really, really fun, though. Yeah. It's, yes. It's it's kind of dumb. There's some really stupid stuff in this part, but this is where I really like perked up and started really enjoying it. Not that anything in this movie was bad up to this point, but I do think the buildup is kind of boring. Whereas like the original Nightmare on Elm Street has a really tight pacing that we talked about. I don't find that this one has that same uh, like really good escalation. Yeah. There's of action. really strong elements in the buildup, but as a whole... Uh, it's kind of boring. It's a bit of a slow burn. I mean, we we did watch all three of these movies back to back, and by the time we got to this one, I was I was starting to get tired. In the first act, I caught myself like dozing off a couple of times. But when we get to this end part, like regardless of how masturbatory or silly it is, it is very fun. Yeah, yeah. Um, and again, it all depends on your level of enjoyment from Freddy Krueger himself. If you're willing to put up with all of this, all of this obsession put around him within the set design and everything of that nature. Yeah. So, the but effects, certainly, if you're watching this, you're probably the effects of the end are great too. Like yes. you have the long tongue that that he like wraps around. Yeah. he's trying to like strangle Heather Langenkamp with. And like uh when uh she just like uh 
finds a snake and just like shoves it in Freddy's <laughs> eye. That's really funny. And when Freddy uh, opens his mouth really wide. And he's to trying like... to like eat the kid. <laughs> yeah, that like the effects are great. And basically it ends with like uh Fred, like the the kid has crawled into like this oven type thing, like in Hansel and Gretel. Freddy is trying to squeeze his way in so he can get the kid. Um, they end up getting the kid out, and then they shove him. They shove him, him, they in, shove yeah. him in the oven, just like the end of Hansel and Gretel, and then the entire temple explodes. Well, yeah, it's an incredible fashion. Like, they yeah. they put a lot of time into just yes. showing that place yes. getting blown the fuck up. Which, yeah. Yeah, I, I did enjoy that. That stuff was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah it's, it it's, all, it's all really fun. It's, and certainly it, at that point, as a way to end your, your, your film, I think that's a great way just to really pace yourself in terms of the action that occurs. Because just go all out, make... Big grand spectacle at the end. I, yeah, I the, the buildup's that. kind of boring, but the payoff is worth it. Well, by there's the end. one thing at the very end that I want to talk about, and that's the emphasis of the script. Okay, yeah. Yes. What did you guys think of that? Oh, because... I, well, again, I think that kind of stuff is like, that's, oh, you know, they're kind of reveling in their own world that they've set up. Just I this think, whole meta. I think that is a little bit too much. Yeah, it felt a little masturbatory. Yes. Especially after how fun the the temple explosions were. It felt right. Like just like, okay, we, we can end it there. We it's don't like, really um, need the script. We, we get it. At well, the, the end of Scream, the killers pull out a script book and they're like, okay, now here's what we're going to do next. Just, right. Well, it ends, it ends with her reading from the actual script of this movie to her little boy. I thought that was a little unnecessary. Fortunately, they don't draw it out too much to really like ruin it. Um, but I did, I did think that I was like, okay, like I, I get the, I get the, the meta standpoint that this film is taking. Like, I don't need them to be reading from a physical copy yeah. of the script. Like, that's a little. It's bit a little much. masturbatory, but it doesn't feel offensive or no, anything. It's, no, 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 it's no. still fun. This is a, a very minor thing, but what did you guys think of uh, Freddy Krueger's wardrobe in this? Because they've gone uh, sans fedora. And they put a trench coat on him. And it's never really explained. It's just kind of like, oh, he's wearing a trench coat now. And I thought that was kind of dumb. It, it's a little silly, but at the same time... It doesn't do... In, it doesn't... The, in the sequels, they, they put him in different stuff. Okay, well... And it gets a little silly. I, I haven't seen those, so I don't know. Yeah, but... for me, I think also at that point, his red and black sweater so iconic. To put him in that would have... Made it too uh, alike. Well, he's um, he's wearing the sweater under the trench coat, right? But to make it his main outfit, just I think something like that would just be a little too bright. I think they wanted to make it. Uh, they wanted to darken a lot of the tones, so giving him that trench coat was apparently. One of uh, when they did the first movie, he was originally supposed to be wearing a red and yellow striped sweater Ooh. instead of red and green. Weird. But then uh, Wes Craven read somewhere that red and green are the two colors that the human brain associates as most contrasting when they're right next to each other. So it, in order to make Freddy sort of like a more like disjointed, weird character, he put him in a red and green striped sweater interesting. Uh, to sort of like trick the eye, which I think is is interesting. And it like it really is it iconic. Yeah. yeah, it's really iconic. Well, shit, should we, should we rate this? Yeah, let's just jump yeah, into ratings. I think so. Uh, I it's... guess you can start, Matisse. Okay. Yeah, this is this is a fun movie. It's uh, like you said, probably the most solid seventh installment of any horror franchise, at least I've ever seen. I feel like some of the context was a little bit lost on me just because I haven't seen any nightmare movies other than one in the remake and then this one. So I don't have quite as strong of a grasp of like what the rest of the movies are like and I think I would have appreciated a little more if I had that but uh it's fun the practical effects are good everybody's good in it uh except the kid in my opinion I'll give it a uh three and a half pods out of five um enjoyable not incredible um but 
a fun movie worthwhile watching for what it's doing i think yeah i i i definitely think this is the best way to take the series after six outings before it it gives a bit of a fresh life to the series and you know i i have to give it a lot of props for you know before scream doing something meta without falling into you know, humor necessarily. It plays it a little more straight than Scream does, which I I found kind of ambitious because mm-hmm. it's it would be easy to make a funny movie of this context, especially with Freddy Krueger, but they actually do a pretty good job of putting in some pretty good scares in it, and the set pieces are a lot of fun. I think this is just a pretty solid movie. I I would give it a four out of five. Yeah, uh, anyone who is a fan of this series will have a lot to appreciate within this one. Of course, if you think Freddy Krueger's overrated and he's just sort of a comedy villain, then you probably won't appreciate all of the time they put into trying to create him as a force of evil that's existed for <laughs> for centuries. I think it really all comes down to whether you are a big fan of the original or just a big fan of Freddy Krueger. But for me, I thought it tried to do meta commentary and it's one of the best examples of it. I think besides Scream, I really like the Scream films. Same. Just to see him exploring that idea before Scream came out is is really enjoyable. So four and a half for me. All right, that gives us an average of four out of five pods. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah, well, before we move on, I want to give a special shout out to a documentary called Never Sleep Again. It's this four hour, uh, I guess you could call it like a an ex- either an extended documentary or a mini series on the making of all of the Nightmare on Elm Street movies. And it really goes into depth on each one. And it's really interesting that... They interview all the main principals, you know, Heather Lodgenkamp, uh, Rennie Harlan, Wes Craven, all these different people. But it's really cool. It used to be on Netflix. I don't know if it's still there, but definitely worth checking out if you got some time to kill. All right. Um, Yeah. So the game this week, I guess we'll call it Freddy's Coming All Over You. Oh, no. (laughs) Um, So I pulled five interesting kills from the Nightmare on Elm Street sequels, and they get a little silly over the series. I will say what the kill is, and I want you guys to guess what movie it comes from. Uh, it will right. It will absolutely just be guessing for and me since so, I have not seen any of yep. these. So just a heads up, next episode is going to be our Valentine's Day special. So the two main movies we'll be uh, covering are My Bloody Valentine and the remake. My Bloody Valentine 3D. Yeah, 3D. So the third movie can be anything related to valentine's day or overbearing love or anything you think would be fit for a valentine's day screening all right all right all right um so the first kill freddie bursts out of his victim's chest alien style well i'm gonna say the second one because i believe that one has to do with him possessing a person or haunting a very specific person so i feel like i remember a scene where freddie krueger comes out of someone's stomach in that one. I'm also going to guess number two. And you would both be correct. Hey. Fuck uh, yeah. All right. That, that movie has several notable kills, including that, and some dude gets killed naked by a bunch of basketballs in the shower. <laughs> um, there, there's some fun stuff in that movie. Um, but the next one is uh, Freddy force feeds his victim. Freddy's quippy stinger on this is uh, bone up a tea bitch um i have no idea so i'm gonna take a wild guess and say number four yeah i feel like that's a kind of joke that would be in the later sequels definitely but i think i'm gonna say five that's dream child or dream yeah, master dream child dream child yeah i'll say and- number five Number five would be correct. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, it, they get really funny and weird at that point. In I'm the sure series. that, yeah, they have to keep stepping it up. Um, so. They really uh, 
do some cool dream set pieces though in that movie i'll have to give it props for that so the next one is freddy switches out his blades for syringes and drugs his victim to death and his uh tagline for this is let's get high that one seems ridiculous but not super ridiculous so i'm gonna guess number three i'm actually gonna say three as well because as i think the dream warriors they're like in some institution or something some hospital so that sounds you both would be correct uh it's number three uh dream warriors yeah dream warriors it's all based in like a group home is that the one with the snake freddy krueger snake or is that uh is that the fifth one possibly it's either three or six. Okay. I can't remember for sure though. All right. It's been oh, a while. Are are there are there any repeats in these or yes, there are repeats? There, yeah. Okay. All right. Um so Freddy becomes a TV and slams his victim into his screen. And his tagline quip for this is Welcome to Prime Time, bitch. I'm gonna guess uh six. I, that that seems like one that would be before, right before New Nightmare. That's very ridiculous. I feel like that one might fall somewhere around more the middle of the series. I'm gonna have to say four on that one. It's actually in three. Oh, oh fuck! Uh, it's Shit. in the group home uh, of Dream Warriors, same as the last one. Damn. Um, All right. Yeah. So they they get silly pretty early in the series, <laughs> but it's still pretty entertaining um so finally uh freddy turns his victim into a cockroach and squishes them oh oh man i'm gonna guess number four oh god yeah i got no clue which one that is um i'm gonna guess number five it is number four (sighs) so that means do you have a tiebreaker you guys are tied so let me uh Pull up a tiebreaker. Didn't plan for that one. I didn't. But. I also did not <laughs> think that we would end up in a tie. I thought Eugene would decisively defeat me on this one. I, I've only seen the first, the second, and the sixth one. So I've only anything making, in the middle is just. I've just been making my best educated guess. Okay, which movie had Freddy Krueger uh, make out with one of his victims? To the point where they couldn't breathe. I'm gonna guess. Uh, I'm gonna guess six again. Fuck it. I'm gonna guess the third one on this one. God damn it! It's four. Oh, Fuck. <laughs> no. Uh, we both lose. Ben decides. Yeah, <laughs> I, I guess I'll decide in that case. <laughs> damn. Uh, That's not how that works. Bro. No, it is how that works. I make the rules. I, I'm fine with it. I'm drunk yeah. with power. All right, yeah. Week. When neither of us can win. So ben next wins. episode, we, like I said before, we'll be covering My Bloody Valentine as well as its remake, My Bloody Valentine 3D. Yes, which I've uh, seen the remake, never the original. I've in seen addition of to them. that, I think it would be fun to cover Misery as Ooh. well. That's what I would have picked too. You so know, I'm... I think it's a it's a fun valentine's day movie i i i feel like it kind of fits in well with the obsessive love creepiness i think so and uh that's another stephen king book that i've read and i have seen that movie before and i really like it it's been a long time so it's a good movie i'm uh i'm very much on board with watching misery in addition to my bloody valentine yeah i think that's a fantastic lineup right over there so Great. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of our episode. Um, If you like the show, please uh, give us a review and a rating on Apple Podcasts. Uh, You can follow the show on Twitter and Facebook, Pod People Pod. My personal Twitter is Mr. Van Awesome. If you care about my thoughts, it's mostly pictures of my cats and retweetings of memes. Uh, Eugene, Ben, you guys have anything you want to plug? Uh, Follow me on Twitter at Mr. Sheets for some dank memes and some hot takes. I... I am learning how to juggle. If you need someone to juggle, (laughs) I need the experience so please please hire me at youjuggle.com i have my own website we can discuss prices when i'm at your house so i will hire you 
to, how, to juggle. How much will you pay me? Fifty cents an hour. Oh fuck yeah! Oh, you're fucking. It's a good moron, deal, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I want you to basically follow me around and juggle wherever I am. And what am I? Way, ju- am I juggling knives? That's a little extra. Uh, you can juggle whatever you want. If oh, if you yeah. if you will juggle knives, I'll give you seventy five cents an hour. And if you'll juggle chainsaws, I'll give you a whole dollar. Oh, holy per fuck. hour. Well, looks like I'm going to buy some chainsaws. <laughs> <laughs> woo, woo, woo. The show is produced by Ben. It is edited by me, and Ben is responsible for our dank-ass music. Our you awesome know. theme song. Yeah, uh, that that good, good tune that I love <laughs> so much. We will be back next time with My Bloody Valentine. Romance is in the air. I'm Matisse Van Rossum. I'm Ben Sheets. And I'm Eugene Lundin. And don't go to sleep or Harvey Weinstein's gonna touch you. Dan Schneider foot rubs. <laughs> <laughs>